Today's reading is from Ephesians 4, uh, verses 1 to 16. That's 1126 in the Red Bibles and 828 in the Black Bibles. Ephesians chapter 4. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with love, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ appointed it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he led captives in his train. And he gave gifts to men. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended, higher than all the heavens, in order to fill the whole universe. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers, to prepare God's people for works of service, so that in the body Christ may be built up, until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will, we will in all things grow up into him who is, is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. This is the word of the Lord. You bow your heads as we stand and let's pray. Father, we thank you that there is a day coming when we will stand in your presence and be welcomed home by the Lord Jesus. And we pray, Father, that we will live our lives here and now in the light of that future and of all that you've done for us in Christ and all that you have for us. Father, please help us by your Spirit to be the people you've called us to be. And so, Father, as we come to your word now, we ask that you will help us to have clarity of mind and purpose. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please do sit down. This is the last of the current series in Ephesians. We're having a break of a week or a couple of weeks or so, and then we'll come back to it. Um, So we are going to continue with Ephesians, and we are... I hope, going to reach the end. A recent survey showed something that we all know, and that is that only about 8% of Australians go regularly to church, 92% don't. What the survey also showed was the reason why most of those people say they don't go to church regularly. No prizes as to what you think that might be, I'm going to tell you. The reason, 47%, so this is the biggest reason why people said they didn't go regularly to church was because church was irrelevant to their life. Isn't that extraordinary? How could church possibly be irrelevant to people's lives? You ask yourself, don't you? Quite difficult to understand. Irrelevant. So why is that? Why do most Australians who don't go to church, which is most Australians, think that church is irrelevant? Well, Australians are very complicated people, aren't we? 
we're difficult to fathom. There are lots of layers to us. And so I have no doubt that the, the reasons are complex, but here's one. One reason why I think people find church irrelevant. For a very long time now, we've had this idea that everything has a natural explanation. There's a common sense reason for everything. Some of those things may be difficult to find, but ultimately there is a common sense, natural reason for anything. Disease. It's caused by viruses, infections. And so the answer, once you've found out what the cause is, is to find some way of dealing with the cause. See, there's a natural explanation. A tsunami comes, and it's caused by shifting tectonic plates. And so the answer is, until we can find some way of more accurately predicting things, to have an early warning system, or maybe even just as well, raise the level of people's standard of living so that the poor can afford to live in safer areas. Everything you see has a natural explanation. And therefore, God and spiritual things for most people are reduced to almost vanishing point in significance. Why do you need God when you can go to the hospital? Why do you need prayer? Why do you need to go to church when there is a natural explanation, even if you don't know what that currently is? But why go to church? So is it any wonder that most Australians find it much more worthwhile to go to the beach or to go on holiday or to have a family barbecue or even to go shopping than come to meet with God's people. And so most Australians don't go to church, unless perhaps it's for a wedding or a funeral or for an older generation to commemorate Anzac. That's pretty much it. Church, for most Australians, is irrelevant. And you know something? I think many of us who are in churches who believe in God struggle with this as well. We struggle to find relevance in spiritual things and in church, therefore. Why would that be? Why is it that as Christians we often struggle with these things as well, which we do? Don't we? Let me, let me make a confession. There have been occasions when I've gone to church, not here, of course, ever. <laughs> I've gone to church despite the fact that I thought it was of no relevance to my life at the time. And I suspect some of you may have done the same. We struggle to find relevance and importance in the spiritual things. They don't seem to be the most important things in our lives. Why would that be? Well, again, no doubt there are lots of reasons because we are very complicated people. But see if these ring any bells with you. The real importance of Christianity is in the future. You know, Jesus came to save us from our sins and to make it possible through faith in him to go to heaven when we die. And so we're really excited about the fact that when we die, we are secure. But it's future. But in the present, well, in the present, it's really good to know that God is always there for me. He cares about me and I can talk to him. So Christianity is a kind of therapy. It makes me feel better. Because I know that I can talk to God and I know that he listens and it makes me feel better about myself and better about my circumstances. Christianity as therapy. 
And then there are the emergencies. There are the times when life doesn't go very well, and God's always there to be called on. I can always cry out to God when something big happens, and maybe, just maybe, He will intervene and do something. But for most of the time, for most of the time, there are far more important things in life than prayer or worship or involving God in my life. The spiritual things don't weigh too heavily on us. Does that ring any bells? One or two of you have been brave and nodded. You know, it's interesting, isn't it? We believe in God's power, don't we? We sing great songs about the power of God. We've just been singing a song about the future. The day when God is going to change this universe and there's going to be a universe of peace and harmony. There's going to be a new heaven and a new earth and we say, yes, we believe that. God is all-powerful and he will bring about his purposes. But in the present... He just doesn't seem to be that significant, does he? Doesn't seem to make much difference to the tsunamis, or cancer, or destruction, or war. The really big things in the world, and the big things in your life and mine. We believe, don't we, that the Lord Jesus was involved in nature and he was involved in people and he was involved in evil and he overcame all those things and we have those stories about his miracles and most of us will want to say, I hope we believe that about Jesus. But that was a long time ago and in the present, life just doesn't seem to be like that. And so in practice, the way we approach our lives as Christians is often not very different from everybody else, from the 92% who don't come regularly to church. Spiritual things can seem remarkably trivial, and God's involvement in our life can be quite small. And so is it any wonder that some of us struggle sometimes with the relevance of church? How can church be relevant when it's about worship and it's about God and it's about spiritual things and it's about meeting with other people so together we can encourage each other to live for God and to worship Him if those are not really important things? And then we come to Ephesians. Well, let's go to Ephesians. So would you turn to Ephesians chapter 1, please? which if you've got a red Bible, is on page 1,225. And let me just remind you of how Paul kicks off in the Black Bible. It's some obscure number that I can't remember. You're all okay. Ephesians chapter 1. Let me remind you after the introduction of how Paul starts off, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with... Every spiritual blessing. He seems to be really, really excited about spiritual things. And it's almost as if you enter a different world when you read what Paul has to say here. It's as if there's something strange and different about him, as if he's on another planet in another realm, because he's incredibly excited about spiritual things in a way that I think often we don't experience. Why is that? Why is that? I want to um, make a suggestion I want you to use your imaginations here. I want to invite you to use your imaginations. I want you to imagine, supposing the way that we see the world, everything has a natural explanation, a natural cause to it. If we can discover what that is, then we can deal with it. Supposing that view of the world is not quite right. Imagine a different way of understanding reality. 
I want to invite you to imagine that because that's what Ephesians tells us. It tells us that there is a different way of seeing the world, a different way of understanding our life and our place in this world. And God has made it known to us. Let's pick it up from verse 7. Paul says, In Christ, that's in him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of his grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. We looked at that last week. Now look at, look at how he goes on. And he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to put into effect when all the times shall have reached their fulfillment to bring all things in heaven and earth under one head, even Christ. What Paul's saying here is this. God has made something known to us about the universe. Something that was previously hidden, he has revealed to us. That's what mystery means. Mystery means not Agatha Christie. It means something was previously hidden, but now God has revealed it to us. He's made it known, and he's done it freely and openly and unstintingly according to his good pleasure. He wants us to know this. So what is it we need to see differently? Well, verse 10 tells us what God's purpose for the universe is. It's to unite all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, that is Christ. That's the destiny, that's the goal of the universe. Unity. We live in a deeply, deeply fragmented world. There's so much about our universe and so much about our world that is mesmerizing and wonderful and stimulating and exciting and beautiful. But it doesn't take very long to realize that that's not the whole truth about the world. And everything seems to have some kind of dysfunction, some kind of flaw in it, and often a tragic and a dangerous and even an evil flaw in it. You could say that the defining characteristic of our universe and of our experience of life is disharmony. There's racism. There are economic differences between people that cause conflict. There are social conflicts. There are, there are broken relationships within families. There are wars. And it's not just between people. We seem to be out of kilter with our environment as well. And sometimes this beautiful creation in which we live can be profoundly dangerous to us. We don't live in harmony with anything for very long. But God's purpose for the future is to unite everything. To bring about a world of peace and harmony that doesn't just impact people, but impacts the whole of creation to bring about unity and harmony. That's God's purpose for the universe, and it involves everything. There won't be any dark corners, any hidden places where the disunity lurks and sneaks out from time to time and sabotages that overall unity. It is to unite everything in heaven and on earth, the whole the totality of the created order. But there's something else I want you to notice. Paul uses this phrase, all things in heaven and on earth. Why does he say that? Why does he use those two phrases, in heaven and on earth? Now, if you've been following the series, you'll know we've come across those terms before. The things in heaven and the things in earth. Paul says we live in two realms. There's the realm of the here and now, of history, of the things that we can touch and feel and experience, of relationships that we have with one another, of emotions. We live in this world that we know about and is, for most of us, the, def the way that we understand the world and our existence. Those are the things on earth, 
the earthly realm. That's what Paul's talking about. But he says there's another realm that exists, the spiritual realm, and we exist in that as well. A realm of spiritual powers and realities and many of those spiritual powers and realities that he's talking about in Ephesians are actually evil and destructive. And he says, we live in these two realities at one and the same time. The things in earth and the spiritual realm as well. That means that when you drive into work tomorrow, you catch the bus, or if you're really brave and you catch the train and you go into the city, it's all here and now, earthly stuff, but you haven't escaped from the spiritual realm. Those two realms exist together. And we are both, we are part of both of them and they interact with each other. And that's what Paul is talking about here. And the thing to understand about those two realms is both of them are dysfunctional. So you read the newspaper or you watch the television and you hear about what's going on in Syria or what's going on in Egypt or what's going on in... There was a shooting in Willoughby apparently just a couple of weeks ago. They kept that quiet, didn't they? Gosh. Well, not that quiet because I found out about it. So There are those things that we hear about and watch and read and experience ourselves This realm, this earthly realm is dysfunctional, but the spiritual realm is dysfunctional as well. A place of evil powers operating. And what's wrong, and this is the most important thing to grasp, what's wrong in the spiritual realm is the ultimate cause of what's wrong here and now for us. What's wrong in the spiritual realm is the ultimate cause of what's wrong in the world that we experience and know in our everyday life. Let me put it like this. I want to put it in three different ways. You can't understand life without recognizing the reality of of evil. You just can't. Evil has infiltrated everything, every corner of our world, and that includes the material and physical universe as well, as that between people. Let me put it another way, second way. There is a spiritual dimension to everything. We can't understand the world merely in terms of natural causes. There's a spiritual dimension to everything. To put it more bluntly, thirdly, war, injustice, poverty, cancer, tsunamis, violence, famine, death, all of those things, all of those things have a spiritual dimension dimension to them. The ultimate cause, the ultimate cause is spiritual. And that's why verse 10 is so important. Because God's plan is to restore the universe, to heal it, to end the disharmony and the fragmentation by dealing with both of those realms and bringing them together so that in the future the spiritual realm will not be one where we fear What comes from there? The interaction between those two will not be one that generates fear and destruction, but blessing and health and healing. And that's already begun in Christ. So back to verse 3, we've already been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. What Paul is saying is that the future That future when God brings everything together, we have already experienced in the here and now. In Christ, we've already had something of an experience of that future unity where he's going to bring everything together. We've already, if you like, been touched by this new world that is to come in the future. I want to uh, close some exit doors because I think some of you might be leaving through some exit doors very quickly. And I don't mean these physical doors here. Let me close exit door number one. 
I am not saying, I am not saying that if you're ill, you shouldn't go to your doctor but simply pray about it. I am not saying that. God has given us an ability to affect things in the here and now, up to a point. Remember those two realms interact with each other? And so, so far, antibiotics have been very successful in helping to save lives that would otherwise have been lost. And so, yes, we should work hard to alleviate suffering and search for new drugs and install better tsunami warning systems and so on. And if you're not feeling too perky this morning, go and see your doctor. Exit door number one. Exit door number two. I am not saying that if you've fallen ill or you fall ill or you have an accident or you lose your job or some catastrophe strikes you, that's because there's a direct spiritual cause. You know, Satan is attacking you. Or, or worse still, you're ill because you've sinned in some kind of way. I am absolutely not saying that. So what am I saying? I'm simply saying this. We need to understand that there is a spiritual dimension to everything. That simply to explain life and the universe in terms of a natural explanation isn't adequate. And I'm saying that the ultimate cause of the suffering and tragedies and evil in the world is spiritual, which means we will never be entirely free from death or sickness or war or famine or tsunamis until that day comes when God brings everything to unity under Christ, the things in heaven and the things on earth. To finish, let me make a few applications. Let me just backtrack a little bit. Verse 10 in Ephesians is the key to making sense of the whole letter. That God's purpose is to bring together the things in heaven and the things on earth together under Christ. Let me make some applications. Number one, we need to take the spiritual realm seriously. We really do. That applies at all kinds of levels, in terms of our own lives, in terms of our church life. It's one of the reasons why prayer is so important. We cannot be the people God calls us to be without God's work. We're involved in spiritual realities and imagining that we can achieve things simply by working hard. Or doing things ourselves is an inadequate way of understanding the Christian life. It's one of the reasons why prayer is so important. Secondly, last week we saw that Jesus has set us free. We have redemption. We are liberated people. We need to live as free people. To live as free people. And so often we don't. We don't feel free because we're struggling financially. We don't feel free because we're having problems with our job. We don't feel free because of issues in our relationships. We don't feel free because we're ill and we're struggling. And that has a huge spiritual impact on us. We need to remember that we have been set free and even though we will experience all kinds of things that go wrong in our lives, we have been set free. Those things do not define you. Your life is not defined by your illness or your failure in your job or whatever it is. You've been set free. You've been redeemed. You're part of this new thing that one day will envelop the whole universe when God brings everything together under one head, which is Christ. 
We need to take the spiritual world seriously. We need to live as free people. The last thing, the Christian life is corporate. You may have noticed that Paul uses phrases like us, we, together. You see, what's happened is that future where God unites everything in heaven and earth, that that unity that's to come has already broken out. And the place where it's broken in is the local church. It's amongst people who are in Christ. You could think of the church as God's shop window where he says to the world, I want you to see, I want you to get a glimpse of what the future will be for the entire universe when everything's united under Christ. There it is, amongst that local group of people who are Christians, who are followers of Jesus. You can see it above all in their relationships with each other, in the way that they live their lives, in the priorities that they have for their lives, but most importantly, in the way they interact together. Because what I've done in that local church is to bring together people who would otherwise probably never speak to each other, never come across each other. People from different social backgrounds, even in Willoughby. People from different intellectual backgrounds, people who are older, people who are younger. I've brought them together and they are trying. But I'm working with these people to unite them because they've been united in the Lord Jesus. You get a glimpse of the future in the local church. The local church is an outpost of the future. It's God's shop window on what the world, what the universe will one day look like. Isn't that extraordinary? Because you look around at each other and you think, my goodness me, is that it? And I can see all of you. Think how I feel. Is this it? A local church like us is the way God has chosen to demonstrate to the world the future, yes. Which means that the local church is really, really, really important and how we do church and how we do our relationships with each other is of absolute importance to us. 92% of Australians don't go to church because most of them think it's irrelevant. How will they come to see the relevance of what God is doing amongst his people and of what the future is? Well, church needs to be important to us, doesn't it? We need to be demonstrating to people And doing that honestly and honorably, not just for effect, we need to be demonstrating to people that church matters to us because we recognize that God has done a work of uniting us in Christ. And he's blessed us with every spiritual blessing so that we can live out our lives together in a way that honors him and points to the future and demonstrates the reality of the presence of the future in the here and now, even though it's only in a small and in many ways a seemingly insignificant measure. Being a Christian is fundamentally corporate. To say, can I live the Christian life without being part of church is like a fish saying, can I live outside of water? We need to demonstrate the importance of the church. Let's pray. Father, thank you for what you've done in us and in Christ. And we have already extraordinary thing, remarkable thing. You've already given us a real living experience of the future in Christ of that world that is to come. And Father, we ask that you will help us to live that out in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.